turn off my phone here. Is Jeff joining today, Julie? Unfortunately, he's not able to join today. I think he is at a staff meeting. Um, cool. Yeah, department staff meeting. So David, that just means that there will be no Zoom bombs today. Oh, okay. Jeff is, is famous for accidentally doing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he sure is. Someone did that to one of my son's classes when, when all this started happening, all the online schooling and so I, i'd seen it on the news but it actually did happen in one of his classes so. yeah some of some of those stories are disturbing yeah <laughs> especially for the little kids yeah yeah luckily these were middle schoolers it wasn't nothing too age inappropriate happened <laughs> nothing they hadn't heard before but yeah, it's kind of crazy why people do that. Hopefully my dogs won't bark through this thing. Mm. Gave them some things to chew on, so hopefully that'll <laughs> keep them busy. We have seen a number of pets yeah. throughout our series. Well, you may see some. We'll see you today. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a new cat. She's a rescue and she screams, like meows really loud and thinks she was dying or something. And she, oh. I've been heard in a few of my calls with attorneys and I just keep my fingers crossed that that doesn't happen on Tuesdays from 12 to one. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it does, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's part of the fun of doing all this online. All right, so I'll make a couple of announcements. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Rachel Hasna, and I'm here with UNM's uh, Division for Community Behavioral Health. Thanks for join, joining our Lawn Mental Health series. A uh, couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, if you are interested in the CEU, uh, we provide the link for an evaluation in the chat um, about five minutes before the end of the lecture. It, so please look for that evaluation in the chat. You'll either copy and paste or you'll click on the link. It'll take you to an evaluation. You fill that out and then you receive um, a, an automatic um, certificate is generated for you. It's your responsibility to save a copy of that. So if you're completing the eval from your phone, you'll want to take a screenshot. And if you're doing it on your laptop, uh, you'll want to just save a copy of the document. If you're calling in and you need that evaluation link, just go ahead and send us an email and we're happy to send you that. Um, Dr. Glassmeyer has agreed to share the PowerPoint slide. So uh, as usual, I'll be emailing the slide as well as the recording link to this lecture um, by the end of the week or the beginning of next week. Um, and I think that's it. So uh, I'll send it over to Julie. Thanks, Rachel. Um, welcome everybody to the University of New Mexico Lawn Mental Health Didactic Series. The series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavior Behavioral Health Sciences Department. Uh, we're so glad to have you joining us here today. Again, my name is Julie Bravko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, I first wanna remind you all that um, we have our new brochure for our forensic postdoc. We are accepting applicants this year, so if you're interested or know someone who's interested, please have them contact us. I also wanna remind you to join us next week. Um, at that time, Melissa Johnson is gonna be presenting what to consider when conducting forensic evaluations with sexual and gender minority clients. And next, I want you to know we'll generally be holding questions until the end of the talk. Please ask them anytime you feel comfortable, but just note that we're not gonna get to them until the end. Um, 
And for those of you who are on a tight schedule but still need your CEUs, I will definitely let you know when that hour has passed. We'll likely be staying on longer to address questions, but to qualify for the CEUs, you only need to stay for that hour. So now it's time for what we've all been waiting for. I wanna to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. David Glassmeyer. Uh, Dr. Glassmeyer is the Director of Psychology Training at Patton State Hospital, which is the largest forensic state hospital in California. Um, they've got approximately 1,500 patients adjudicated under various legal commitments, including incompetent to stand trial, not guilty by reason of insanity, or as a condition of parole under California's mentally disordered offender statute. For the last 19 years, he's conducted forensic assessments at Patton and in private practice. Um, at Patton, he oversees the APA accredited internship in clinical psychology and the postdoctoral fellowship program in forensic psychology. He regularly teaches seminars on forensic psychology, the interface of culture and psychology and psychological assessment. He has an active research program in the areas of feigning assessment, the forensic applications of the MMPI 2RF, and the assessment of trial competence, and he's published over 30 peer-reviewed studies in those areas. Dr. Glassmeyer received his PhD in clinical psychology from Pacific Graduate School of Psychology at Palo Alto University in 2001, and he completed a postdoc in forensic psychology at Patton State Hospital in 2002. He's a licensed uh, psychologist in California, and he's been board certified in forensic psychology since uh, two, 2006. And I wanna also add that he's a really nice person. Um, so Dr. Glassmeyer, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and New Mexico's Behavioral Health Services Division, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for presenting today. We're so grateful for your time and expertise and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Julie. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting today on, uh, the title is The Evaluation of Competence to Stand Trial, Case Law, Cultural Considerations and Practical Issues. And um, I'm just going to move over to my learning objectives. Uh, I'm mostly going to be focusing on the second of those three objectives, um, but I am going to start out uh, talking about case law. And basically my learning objectives are that uh, by the end of this, I'm hoping that uh, you'll, you'll be able to discuss the main holdings of a handful of landmark mental health cases related to competence to stand trial. Uh, I'm only gonna scratch the surface in terms of uh, case law. Uh, there are obviously many more cases than I will go over in this short time period, uh, but I am going to hit some of the major ones. Uh, the second goal is really for you to be able to outline a strategy for integrating cultural considerations into your case formulations in competency assessments in particular, but also just forensic assessments more broadly. <clears throat> um, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about uh, what I'm going to be doing. I'm not going to talk about a specific case formulation approach as much as I'm going to talk about why it's important to consider cultural issues when doing forensic assessments uh, and a process for thinking about some of the main issues that may come about in terms of how you perceive the case, how the examinee perceives you, and how that might impact uh, the behaviors and the symptoms that they report and um, how you formulate the case. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about some practical steps that you can use in forming culturally informed uh, opinion, opinions. Um, so the first uh, issue about case law, um, in general, uh, when doing competency evaluations or any forensic evaluation, I think it's very important for you to anchor your uh, thinking, your opinions, your case formulation uh, by an understanding of the relevant case law. And so there, I think there always are a handful of questions that you want it to be able to answer in terms of what are the legal parameters of my work in this particular legal venue. So when doing a competency assessment, I think the important questions are, what is the legal definition of competency? When should the issue be raised? Or when is it raised? Who has the burden of proof? And what's the standard or threshold of proof? How, how much uh, does it need to be shown that somebody's incompetent, essentially, before they're found incompetent? Or how much competency on the flip side is required before they're found competent? And another issue I'll talk briefly about is what happens when someone is unlikely to attain competency in the foreseeable future. There are many other issues that, um, that there's case law addressing many other issues that are really important to competence assessment, but they're beyond the scope of what I can cover in the limited time period today. Um, so the first case, and a lot of these cases, for those of you who have a lot of experience in this area, these cases will be review. 
Um, for those of you for whom this is uh, newer material, uh, I'm going to hit some of the main cases. Uh, so the, the really important case, if you're going to be just talking about what is the legal definition of trial competence, is a U.S. Supreme Court case of Dusky v. U.S., a 1960 case. And uh, basically, it's one of the shortest uh, Supreme Court cases that I've ever read. I, I imagine it's one of the shortest out there. And uh, they define competence as, and I'll, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit just to uh, take out some of the, the sexist language from the 1960s, um, but the test of competence must be whether the defendant has present, uh, sufficient present ability to consult with his or her lawyer with a reasonable degree of rational understanding, and whether the defendant has a rational as well as a factual understanding of the proceedings against him or her. Um, so I underlined a few of the areas that I thought are important to think about. The first one is present ability, and that basically shows us that competency status can change over time. Um, so it's, it's not a, a permanent thing. If you're incompetent, you can become competent. And if you're competent, you can become incompetent. Uh, the next word that I think is important to look at in this is the word reasonable, uh, which implies that a perfect understanding of the trial process is not required. It's a reasonable understanding. And obviously that leaves open some interpretation of what, what, make, what, sort of, uh, what is reasonable at what level or threshold is the understanding reasonable. And then the last word I just wanted to highlight was the word rational. Uh, so a factual understanding of the trial process alone is not sufficient. There also has to be some rational understanding. Um, and an example I could give with that would be, for example, uh, we spend a lot of time in our trial competency groups really teaching that rational information. What are the four pleas? Who are the major participants in the courtroom? So you might get an answer from someone. You ask them, who is the judge? And they, they give you a nice answer about their factual understanding. And they say, oh, the judge is the person who runs the courtroom and makes sure the rules are followed and that, that the defendant gets a fair trial. Well, that sounds like a pretty good factual description of the judge. Uh, but then if you start digging a little further and you find out that they have a lot of delusions about the judge and they think that the judge is part of a cult that is going to, um, that, you know, that, that is going to equate you because you're part of, they think you're part of that too or something like that. Uh, then there's really not a rational understanding, even though they showed a good factual understanding of the role of the judge. Uh, so the next question I'm going to address is when should the issue of competence be raised? And there are a couple of different uh, cases that I'm going to highlight real quickly. So in Pate v. Robinson, the Supreme Court basically said that competence should be raised whenever there's a bona fide doubt regarding competence. So the threshold for raising the issue is relatively low. Uh, and a follow-up case to that, uh, Drope v. Missouri in 1975, really shows us a couple of different important things. In this case, the defendant um, had basically shown signs of a psychiatric decompensation in the middle of the trial. And, um, and what the Supreme Court held is that trial courts need to consider all evidence suggestive of a mental disorder. So not just what comes out in the pretrial competency assessments. Um, but uh, the behaviors of the defendant during court and even outside of the courtroom uh, should be considered. But also whenever any doubt is raised, uh, there should be a motion to allow for an evaluation of competence at any point in the trial. So even if a defendant is competent at the outset of the trial, uh, the court should remain cognizant to the fact of the fact that that may change during the trial. Um, so the next couple of cases I'm going to talk about have to do with who has the burden and what is the standard or threshold. Uh, so the first case I'll talk about is Medina v. California, and this is a 1992 Supreme Court case. And basically, the California's uh, penal code presumed that a defendant was competent, uh, essentially, unless proven otherwise. And they placed the burden on the defendant to prove incompetence uh, by the threshold of preponderance of the evidence. So there are three basic thresholds that you'll see in, in uh, these types of cases. So Preponderance simply is uh, more likely than not. Um, so that's the, a lower level threshold. And at the other extreme, we have beyond a reasonable doubt, which is what it sounds like, uh, that there, there's almost no doubt, almost 100%. And then there's this standard sort of in between clear and convincing evidence, which uh, doesn't have a, a exact percent definition. I've tried to find that in the literature and I've seen estimates of 70 or 80%. I've seen different estimates, two thirds, I think I've seen as well. Uh, but there's no clear definition of that. And what the court held is that uh, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment does allow states to presume a defendant competent, and it does allow the burden to be placed on the defendant. And they affirmed that preponderance standard uh, that was used in California, that you can 
uh, require the defendant to prove their competent or their incompetence, uh, but just by the level of more likely than not. Uh, and then about four years later, uh, the Supreme Court addressed a similar issue in Cooper v. Oklahoma. But up until that point in Oklahoma, they had a standard that required the defendants to meet the burden of proof by a or by a, sorry clear and convincing evidence. Uh, and the Supreme Court held that that although defendants can be required to meet the burden of proof, the standard cannot be higher than the preponderance standard, uh, the more likely than not standard. And their general reasoning on that is by using a, um, a, a, a um, clear and convincing standard, the courts would be likely to try some individuals who are more likely than not incompetent. And they said that that does not follow due, due process. Uh, the final issue I'm going to talk about real quickly, and then I'm going to move on uh, to some other parts of the presentation, is what happens when a defendant is unlikely to attain competence in the foreseeable future. And the big case, uh, there are a number of cases, but the big important one I think to know about is Jackson v. Indiana in 1972. And the defendant in that case uh, had uh, developmental uh, disabilities, intellectual disabilities, uh, difficulties with communication, and essentially was unlikely ever to become competent to stand trial. And the Supreme Court held that indefinite commitment as incompetent to stand trial is a violation of equal protection because there are more lenient commitment standards associated with competency statutes and more stringent release standards relative to individuals who are not charged with a crime. Um, so essentially, uh, they indicated that, uh, I apologize for my dogs there, uh, they indicated that's a violation of due process to hold a defendant uh, for more than a reasonable period of time necessary to determine whether there's a substantial probability that they will attain competency in the near future or in the foreseeable future. Um, and that reasonable time uh, varies by jurisdiction. In California, currently we use uh, two years. Uh, two years still seems like more than a reasonable time to me because at our hospital, the average time to, for a, a defendant to attain competence when they're hospitalized as incompetent is about 90 days. Uh, so to hold them for two years before we need to essentially show that they're unlikely to become competent, uh, that's significantly longer than the usual time it takes us to, to get someone competent. Um, and if they're not likely to become competent, alternative dis dispositions need to be pursued, such as civil commitment or dismissal of the charges. Uh, I'm going to skip through. I put a few extra slides about some additional uh, legal issues that you might or questions you might have, uh, but I don't have time to go through all of those today. Um, I really want to get into the meat of my presentation, which is cultural considerations in doing competency assessments. Uh, and so I, I started with a couple of questions. And the first one is, is culture really an important consideration when conducting competency assessments? And I have heard people ask that. Uh, and in, in general, essentially, aren't examinees either competent or not competent, regardless of culture? Um, and so I'm going to make the argument that, uh, yes, it is important to consider culture. Uh, and even though a legal statute or standard may not specifically talk about culture, your ability to do a, a competent and ethical job at reviewing the case, considering the case, formulating the case, and coming up with a forensic opinion requires you to use essentially a set of cultural lenses through which you uh, examine the defendant in, in a uh, competency uh, setting. So the first thing I'll say is that I think every case has a cultural component. It doesn't matter if the individual you're evaluating comes from an underrepresented group, an ethnic or cultural minority group, um, obviously, a lot of those cases will have a cultural component, but it, it, you can evaluate anybody and that person has been raised, socialized, and lives within a cultural milieu, within a cultural environment. So you need to consider culture. Additionally, um, <clears throat> we as evaluators are cultural beings uh, and we need to consider our own cultural beliefs, systems, and values and how those may impact our opinions whenever we're doing a uh, case formulation. So basically I put down here in this second bullet point, cultural formulation equals case formulation. Uh, if you think about in algebra, my son's a freshman in high school, I've been helping him with his algebra homework the last few years. Cultural formulation equals or is, you can replace the equal sign with an is, is case formulation. And in, as you know, in algebra, you can sort of take things on both sides of the equation and switch them around, and it doesn't really change the meaning of the equation. Case formulation is cultural formulation. So. My argument is that if you're doing case formulation, by definition, if it's a good case formulation, you have considered culture. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, real briefly, about some of the standards in our field uh, 
I think that also would make this argument that we need to consider culture in all cases. So even if we look at just the basic general principles of the APA ethics code, and remember those are not enforceable standards, those are really our aspirational goals as a field. Uh, and if you look at the general principles, really all of them to some degree would indicate that we need to consider culture. Uh, principle A, we care to do no, work to do no harm. Um, well, to do that, I think we need to consider the person's cultural worldview, their cultural environment. Fidelity and responsibility, we establish relationships of trust with those with whom we work. Uh, that requires us to have an appreciation for the cultural similarities and differences we have with the individuals that we may be working with and how that impacts the relationship. Integrity, we seek to promote accuracy, honesty, and truthfulness in our practice. Uh, accuracy, I think, requires that you consider culture, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. Um, justice, so we essentially take reasonable, uh, we exercise practice to ensure that our own potential biases and boundaries of our competence don't lead to or condone unjust practices. So we all have potential biases, and that's one of the arguments I will be making, and we need to uh, consider how those may impact our formulation of cases. And then respect uh, for people's rights and dignity. Uh, this one very obviously talks about culture uh, and we work to eliminate the effect of bias on our opinions uh, when working with members from underrepresented or marginalized groups. Um, and you can see it also just in the, um, and I'm not gonna go through these, but in the enforceable standards. And here are some of the enforceable standards from the ethics code that I think clearly uh, are related to some of those issues that I just talked about. We can see the same thing in the specialty guidelines for forensic psychologists, um, issues of integrity, impartiality, fairness, uh, competence, um, understanding the scientific foundation of our testimony and our opinions. Um, you have to look at who, is, who are the subjects in these studies that we are basing our opinions on. Uh, is the person that I'm evaluating, uh, is that a person to, for whom that study will generalize uh, from a cultural perspective? Um, the appreciation of individual and group differences, using appropriate methods and procedures, and appreciating and understanding individual differences, uh, obviously um, really talk to us about integrating culture into our thinking. And then if we look at the APA guidelines on multicultural education, training, research, and practice, uh, they talked about the fact that we are all cultural beings. Uh, so just because you're in the evaluator position, you're on that side of the evaluation, does not mean you're not a cultural being that brings to the evaluation attitudes and beliefs that could uh, detrimentally influence your perceptions or interaction with the individual. So we need to really be aware of that. And I'll talk about that today. So a really a full discussion of culturally driven case formulation is beyond the scope of a, a one hour presentation. Um, so really I'm gonna focus on the following issues and then I'll, I'll integrate that with talking about competence to stand trial as well. Um, so uh, by the end of this, I, I hope that you can uh, think about ways to develop a culturally informed framework for viewing and interpreting data. And here are the main points that I think can help you to do that. First of all, understanding and appreciating that there is sy uh, systemic discrimination uh, in our society and that that impacts both the examinee and the examiner, regardless of what cultural background the two come from. Uh, having an openness to examining personal bias, I think is very important. Considering the stimulus value of both the examiner and the examinee on the perceptions of both in the, uh, in the evaluation dyad. Uh, understanding the concept of stereotype threat and its impact on examinee behavior and performance during an evaluation, and then considering the appropriateness of your chosen assessment procedures. Those are some of the important things that I want to talk about today. Uh, so in terms of understanding systemic discrimination and its impact on the examinee and the examiner, Obviously, we've seen a lot about this in the news uh, of late. There, there's been a lot more um, because of the, I think, the frequency with which people carry around cell phones with cameras and video. Um, we are seeing a lot of what has been going on for a long time in terms of systemic discrimination. It's coming out much more into the public light. Uh, but an article that I think is very useful for approaching this and thinking about this is an article on critical race psychology by Salter and Adams. Uh, and they essentially are, uh, their proposal is an extension of critical race theory, uh, primarily focusing on psychology. And essentially what they're proposing is that race should be considered not just as one domain among, any, among many for psychological investigation, but instead really as that conceptual lens through which to analyze all of psychological science. Uh, 
Um, and so that's one of the things in there. They talk a lot about, they give a lot of examples of systemic discrimination uh, and its impact on really everyone in society. Uh, so it goes much further than what I'm talking about here. I highly recommend you read that article. Uh, I think it's a really nice, thoughtful approach to thinking about this. Um, and an appreciation of this perspective, I think, can assist forensic examiners in developing a culturally informed framework for viewing and interpreting data. Uh, we all know, I think it's, it's well known, that people from marginalized groups, groups that have less power in our society, are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Uh, so you're likely to be seeing a lot of individuals when you're doing competency assessments who have really been uh, the victim of systemic discrimination at some point in their lives or throughout their lives. So really appreciating this perspective, I think, can really be a starting point. Uh, it can help you to raise awareness of your personal bias as well as societal biases that might creep in to uh, the opinion forming process in conducting forensic evaluations. Uh, and we all have uh, biases. We're all raised uh, and socialized in a broader culture, in a broader environment. Um, so I think we need to be aware of and willing to look at those. Um, and then uh, that can help us to uphold those ethical guidelines that I talked about regarding integrity, impartiality, and appreciation of individual and cultural differences in conducting our forensic work. And I really think that a framework similar to that CRT perspective, although that focuses on issues related to race, you can really apply that similar framework to examining and working with individuals from any marginalized group, um, not just uh, based on racial or ethnic background. Um, so I'm gonna just talk about briefly about a couple of studies uh, that uh, start to point again to the need to look at these issues. Um, so this study here uh, by Pinals et al. Uh, evaluated all of the defendants in Massachusetts who were referred to a court clinic over a several year period for a screening evaluation of trial competence, criminal responsibility, or both. So these are pre-trial examinees in the forensic system. And they found that African-American defendants, but not Hispanic defendants, uh, were significantly more likely than white defendants to be referred for an inpatient evaluation after doing an outpatient forensic screening evaluation. So we're seeing there's some difference in how people are referred and how the cases get disposed of and processed um, that's related to the race of the defendant. Um, now it's certainly possible that there's some third variable in there that, that uh, correlates with the uh, racial or ethnic background of the defendants that may have also been influencing those decisions. Uh, but it does provide us some evidence that there are differences in how people are being treated in the system. And they also found that among male defendants, both Hispanic and African-American individuals were more likely than white individuals to be referred for an inpatient evaluation in a strict security facility, regardless of their diagnoses or the level or of severity of their criminal charges. So that's providing even further evidence that there are differences in terms of how these cases were being processed and, and the disposition uh, of the evaluation um, so I think that's important to think about. Um, and then there's this study uh, that was conducted by Harrison Weiss in 2018. And basically they uh, had law students and attorneys read vignettes about a uh, defendant um, who was either, they randomly assigned the, defend, the uh, person to read a vignette where the defendant was either African-American or Caucasian. And they also varied in their level of fitness to stand trial. So basically there were different levels of trial fitness. And there also were uh, two different uh, the only other thing that was manipulated was the race of the defendant. Uh, and then they asked them to indicate whether they would refer that client for a competency evaluation. Uh, and the, the good thing that they found is that both the law students and the attorneys generally were more likely to refer incompetent rather than competent defendants. So that shows that they understood what competency is. Um, but the law students were more likely to refer African-American defendants than Caucasian defendants only when referring defendants who are unfit due to a lack of rational understanding of the relevant legal case. So there was a difference among the law students in terms of whether they thought an individual even needed a competency assessment. And the only variable really that was manipulated there was the race of the defendant. Uh, the, uh, the other aspects of the vignette were identical. Uh, the attorneys did not have that same uh, finding. Uh, that finding did not come with the attorney, the licensed attorneys, but it did, was seen with the um, law students. So really, I, I want you to think about the idea of bias. Uh, and that's the second thing I want to talk about, be having an openness to examining personal bias. And there's a really nice study that was done by Neil and Brodsky, published in 2016, where they interviewed uh, 20 board-certified forensic psychologists 
and then did a follow-up mail survey with a much larger number of forensic psychologists to investigate personal awareness of bias among examiners and the strategies that are used to de-bias forensic judgments. And they really found that there is a continuum of bias awareness uh, that mapped onto kind of like onto a stages of change model from really having no awareness, no understanding that there's a need to think about this or change behavior, uh, all the way to people who are actively thinking about bias, understood that they have biases and take active steps to manage that um, and to make sure that that doesn't impact their opinions. Uh, in general, they found that evaluators perceive themselves as less vulnerable to bias than their colleagues. There's this sort of uh, bias, uh, bias uh, blind spot uh, among uh, evaluators, and that's not surprising. We all probably think we do a better job than others at uh, taking care of our own biases and, and being aware of them. Um, but they did find some recurring situations that pose challenges for examiners in terms of bias. And there were a number of areas. They weren't just looking at culture. But some of the ones that they found that were related to culture, I thought, uh, were disliking or feeling sympathy for the defendant, disgust or anger toward the offense. I think both of those have some, to some degree to do with the examiner's personal belief system, uh, the examiner's personal history, uh, the cultural environment in which the examiner was raised and socialized likely impact your thinking about those things. Limited cultural competency is obviously related to culture uh, and pre-existing values. Um, so they did find that examiners were aware of some of these things impacting their, their opinions. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, stimulus value. So uh, we all have a stimulus value. Uh, the examiner has a stimulus value. The examinee has a stimulus value. And basically, that stimulus value is impacted by a number of things, including just our physical appearance. Uh, do we physically appear? Uh, what is our gender? Uh, our gender appearance? What is our racial or ethnic appearance, um, whether or not those uh, appearances are accurate, there's an appearance that we have that will most likely impact how we are perceived and the types of thinking and, and attributes that get projected onto us by those who interact with us. So I think it's very important for us to think about our own stimulus value before we step into a, an interaction with a forensic examinee, because that is going to impact their ability to, first of all, trust that they're going to get a fair evaluation. Uh, it will impact whether they feel guarded or open to talking to us. Um, and so it's going to impact what they give to us in an evaluation context. Uh, so I think it's very important to be aware of your own stimulus value when entering into the assessment process, particularly in an area where you're doing pre-trial forensic evaluations, uh, given that just the the real lack of uh, power and control that a defendant has when they're undergoing a forensic evaluation pre-trial, like a competency assessment. Um, so the next topic I'm going to talk about is stereotype threat. Uh, and stereotype threat um, is a social psychological predicament in which individuals are at a risk for confirming widely, negative, widely held negative stereotypes about their demographic group. It's a self-evaluative threat. And the pioneering study on this, the classic study, was done by Steele and Aronson and, and published in 1995. Um, and basically what they showed is that this stigma priming process, so if you primed individuals to think about stigma, um, that decreased performance on an aptitude test among African-American students. And so this, this uh, test that they gave was essentially a like a GRE verbal item type of uh, verbal task. Uh, and these students uh, were, some of them were randomly assigned to be in a group where they were told that this test of verbal abilities was diagnostic of their intellectual ability. And then other students were not told that it was diagnostic. They had two other conditions, uh, one where they just sort of took the test and one where they were told that this would be challenging, but not necessarily diagnostic of intellectual abilities. And I'm sort of going to lump those two groups into one. So we've got the diagnostic group and then the groups that were not told that it was diagnostic of intellectual ability. And the students who were told that this was diagnostic of their intellectual abilities, the African-American students, performed lower than African-American students who were not primed with this information. But that same effect was not found among white students. And they basically had two racial groups in that particular study, African-American and white students. They also found, they did a series of studies that are in this article, that compared to African-American students in the non-diagnostic conditions, the African-American students in that diagnostic condition showed higher levels of stereotype activation. They were more likely to think about things associated with stereotypes about their group. 
they had higher levels of self-doubt activation. They were more likely to endorse or, or to, to, to think about things related to self-doubt. And these were sort of word completion tasks where there was a stem of a word and they had to fill in the word. And there were words that could pr be primed for stereotypes or self-doubt, uh, but also there, there were enough open letters that you could also come up with words that were not. Um, and so they're comparing these two groups. And then the diagnostic group, higher levels of stereotype activation, higher levels of self-doubt, and higher levels of stereotype avoidance. They did not find that same pattern among white students. Um, they also found that 75% of the African-American students in their diagnostic condition chose not to record their race on a questionnaire before taking the test, whereas all of the participants in the non-diagnostic condition did report their race on that form. And they felt that that was another possible sign of stereotype avoidance. Um, and then they conducted a final experiment where the main independent variable was what, simply whether they manipulated whether or not the participants were required to list their race before taking the test. So they randomly assigned them to list your race in one group and do, they don't ask you to list your race in the other group. And they hypothesized that having participants record their race just prior to the test should prime a racial stereotype about ability for the African-American participants and thus make them stereotype threatened. So that stigma priming effect. And as hypothesized, the African-American students in the race prime condition performed worse than in the no race prime condition. But that same uh, finding was not found among the white students. Um, and that's really, I think, a very powerful finding that really all it took to impact their performance on this ability test was simply having them list their race on a form before they took the test. Um, that seems to me to be a very strong uh, finding. Uh, they've, these findings have been replicated in other contexts involving other types of stereotypes and with other groups, uh, but obviously in the context of this presentation, I don't have time to go through all of those different things, but it's, it's a well replicated finding. Um, so what about in forensic evaluations? And, and for years, I've been talking about this with our trainees, with our interns and postdocs, about being aware of stereotype threat when you're doing testing in particular uh, with individuals from groups for whom there may be negative stereotypes, particularly about ability. Um, but what about in forensic evaluations? Well, think about this. We often ask for de demographic information early in our assessment process, and often because we're trying to do a good job at doing a culturally informed evaluation. And we might be starting the stereotype threat and stigma priming process unintentionally by doing that. So you might wanna think about how you time the questions and when in the evaluation you ask questions related to culture, identity, and so forth um, to make sure that they're not, you're not priming someone right before you do part of the evaluation that might be impacted by the priming. Uh, there was one study by Andretta et al. in 2015 that looked specifically at stereotype threat and stigma priming in a forensic evaluation context. Um, so I'm just looking at my time here. So uh, they, uh, eva they examined and conducted their study among African-American uh, juveniles who were within, getting evaluated within a juvenile court system. Um, and they looked at the impact of stigma priming on the levels of self-reported conduct disorders, symptoms, oppositional defiant symptoms or behaviors, major depressive symptoms, and generalized anxiety symptoms on a standardized self-report measure. Uh, so they had two studies, <coughs> excuse me. And in the first study, they, they did the stigma priming by simply asking the participants to state their racial group membership before they completed this self-report measure on internalizing and externalizing behaviors. So it's a lot like that final study out of Steele and Aronson's uh, uh, article that I cited earlier. And they didn't find any differences in self-report of internalizing and externalizing behaviors between the stigma primed and non-stigma primed groups. Uh, and they basically felt like maybe in the forensic context, um, you know, that this priming work, this level of priming worked to induce a change, uh, an experimental change or, or change in the dependent variable in, in, on an ability test in a college setting but it wasn't enough of a, of a uh, intervention, for lack of a better term, to change the behavior or self-report in this forensic context reporting these types of things. Uh, so then they, they looked at whether a, a higher level of uh, stigma priming might impact self-reported uh, symptoms and behaviors. So they had respondents complete a racial identity scale prior to reporting on internalizing and externalizing behaviors. So they were asked a lot more detailed questions about their racial identity. And they found that uh, respondents who were in that stigma-primed condition who completed that questionnaire 
uh, that scale ahead of time. They reported higher levels of oppositional defiant behaviors and higher levels of depressive and anxiety symptoms, uh, but there were no differences in the conduct disorder behavior self-report compared to peers in the non-stigma primed group. So in a forensic context, they did find that the type of information that was provided differed uh, whether, depending on whether or not somebody was asked questions about racial identity just prior to reporting that information. And I think this leaves us in a little bit of a, a bind because I said earlier, I think you should be considering culture and uh, asking questions about culture and doing forensic evaluations. But at the same time, we wanna make sure that we're not unintentionally starting a process that will alter what we get provided in a way that may make the evaluation potentially less accurate. Although it may make it more accurate, we're not really sure. We just know that it makes it different. So I think what you want to think about is uh, when you're doing your evaluation, be aware, particularly if you're evaluating anyone that's a member of any type of marginalized group for whom there may be a negative stereotype out there, uh, you want to think about how that may impact the information that they're providing and how the process, the forensic assessment process may impact what they tell you and how and the behavior and abilities that they demonstrate for you. Uh, and I think this was the final thing um, in my list that I wanted to cover in terms of uh, some of the um, some of the cultural things that you need to really consider in doing uh, competency assessments in particular, but any forensic assessment is what is the, what is the appropriateness of the assessment instruments that I'm using? Are they appropriate for the individual that I'm evaluating? Um, and we generally, I think, try to use assessment instruments and procedures that have some grounding, some empirical grounding in the research literature. Um, and so hopefully we're using instruments that have had some type of uh, rigorous empirical research to see if they work, if, they, if they're actually measuring what we think they're measuring, if they predict what we think they predict, uh, if they help us make the decisions that we think they help us make. Um, but you have to really look back at the studies that were done. Many of the studies of clinical and forensic instruments that we use do not really include sufficient numbers of participants from underrepresented groups. Um, and I've often been asked, well, what about a test like the WACE or the MMPI? There's these, these large tests uh, that were developed in a commercial context where there was a lot of money that went into forming normative groups. And so on some of these tests, they have uh, nationally representative normative samples, right? They, they will use a process of first looking at the demographics of the country as a whole, and then they will uh, use a stratified random sampling process where they stratify the sample that they get to include uh, equal proportions of various cultural, ethnic, racial, and gender groups to what you would see in the national population. And also they'll, they'll sometimes stratify it with geography, uh, different regions of the country. Um, and so essentially the argument at the end is we have a group that represents the country as a whole because we stratified this to represent everybody proportionally with the same level of representation they have in the national population. And that would all be great uh, if that really worked to make sure that a test can generalize to individuals from all subgroups within that sample. Uh, but think about it this way. If you have a group that makes up 10% of, uh, of the national population in terms of their, their percentage of representation of the national sample, uh, and then they get put into this sample in the, uh, in the test normative sample uh, at a rate of 10% to mirror that national 10% uh, representation. Well, that means that they are only represented in 10% of that sample. That means that 90% of the variance on that particular instrument is uh, created by, is, is produced by individuals who are from a different cultural or ethnic or racial or gender group than that individual who is represented only 10%. Um, now that won't be a problem if there is no difference in the test's ability to predict, the test's ability to work with that particular, an individual from that particular group. Um, but if it's never been studied with that particular person's group, then we don't really know if the larger normative sample will generalize nicely to an individual from that group. Um, so I think you cannot assume that cutoff scores or classification accuracy indices or um, uh, predictive capacity of a test will work for one group if it was not studied on that group. Uh, 
so just because it's been proven or, or studied with one group does not mean it's applicable to other groups. So to put it another way, equivalence should not be assumed unless proven otherwise. And I've come up against this even when doing research, even when submitting research studies for publication. Uh, a lot of the studies that we do in our research lab have to do with looking at cutoff scores of various measures of feigning and malingering and, and uh, uh, those types of behaviors. And we'll look at whether cutoff scores work equally well across different cultural groups and different racial and ethnic groups or do across genders even uh, and across different diagnostic groups. And I have had editors basically send the, the study back and you know, hopefully at least with a revise and resubmit. And one of the big questions they'll say is, well, you haven't shown us why we should even be studying this. Is there any evidence that we would even expect differences across cultural groups on this particular scale? Uh, and if not, what's the justification for doing the study? Uh, and sometimes I have to reply and say, well, there is no research that shows that there's a difference. And that's why I'm doing the study to see if there's a difference. Sometimes we need to just do it to see if there's a difference. Um, so I think that there often is this assumption that unless something's proven otherwise, uh, that there's equivalence, that there's not a problem unless it's proven that there's a problem. Um, and I, I'm basically saying, I think we can't make that assumption. So now I wanna sort of put it all together uh, in terms of um, when we're doing competency assessment and how all of this, I think, should impact your thinking when you're doing competency assessment. So again, um, cultural issues uh, are, are not something that you're likely to see mentioned in a, a legal statute for, for the competency, the definition of trial competency in any jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> really what we're looking at is whether by reason of a, a mental disorder uh, or defect, that's the terms that, that are used in California, the individual has difficulty either understanding the trial process at some level, rationally and factually, uh, or consulting with counsel and presenting a defense in a rational manner. Um, but your ability to really examine that and look at that and formulate the case, my argument is that you have to think about the cultural context of the individual. Um, so let's just talk about a, a few uh, areas where this often, I think, can come into play. Um, so if you think about a pretrial defendant undergoing a competency assessment, and I already mentioned this early, but they're, or earlier, but they're in a very vulnerable position. Uh, if you really try and think about it, put yourself in their shoes. This is an, generally most of the competency assessments, at least that I've ever done, are generally more serious uh, offenses, alleged offenses. Uh, sometimes somebody may get a competency assessment with a misdemeanor. That I, I know that does occur, but oftentimes uh, they're getting done with more serious assessments or serious uh, offenses uh, with more serious repercussions if they're found guilty. So they're in a very vulnerable position. Uh, they're pretrial. Uh, they're looking at potentially doing a lot of time in a jail or prison setting. Um, they're often scared if they have a mental illness, which many of them do. And that's why they're referred for competency assessment. They may not fully understand what's going on. They're in a very vulnerable position. Uh, and then if you add on top of that, uh, if the individual comes from a, a group that has historically been marginalized in our society and has historically uh, been exposed to and the victim of systemic discrimination in, in the level of opportunity that they have, in the way that they've been treated in the justice system, uh, in the educational opportunities they've had, it really in, in multiple areas and domains of their life, they're in a very vulnerable position. And so we really need to do our best, first of all, to help them to uh, trust that they're going to get a fair evaluation, and then obviously to make sure that we give them a fair evaluation. Um, and I often hear people s express a significant amount of distrust toward the legal system, uh, particularly among individuals from traditionally or historically marginalized groups in society uh, where they'll say things, and I'm sure this to anybody who does this type of work, this, these are common things you'll hear. They'll say things like, well, I'm not gonna get a fair trial because the system's against me. Uh, I can't get a fair trial. Um, and oftentimes they'll tie that to their particular uh, cultural or racial background. Um, and I've seen people say, um, this person has schizophrenia or this person is paranoid because they think that the system's against them. I have seen that in reports. Um, without really seeing a full, uh, at least analysis of whether that is a paranoid thought process, whether that is a break with reality or whether that's something that is really a, a reality for that individual. 
So I think you need to really consider whether that distrust in the system that we see very often when doing competency assessments, is that based on uh, a rational reaction to systemic discrimination based on the person's lived experience? Is, it, is that distrust based on a rational reaction to systemic discrimination based on their expectations for how they might get treated within the system? Or alternatively, is it an irrational understanding of the system based on psychiatric symptomatology or something else? Um, and I think that viewing cases through that critical race psychology perspective can really assist us in at least forcing us to think about and differentiate those different causes of distrust toward the system and the participants in the system and the fairness of the system or lack thereof in some cases. Um, and then putting that together, does that reported distrust of the system impact the person's, the defendant's rational appreciation of the proceedings against him or her, as well as their ability to consult with counsel with a reasonable degree of rational understanding? Um, and so you, you really need to look at where is that distrust coming from? Uh, what is the distrust if it's there? Um, who is it placed on? Is it placed on the system as a whole? Is it placed on the attorney specifically? Is it placed on the judge? Is it placed on the, eva the forensic evaluator? Um, and all of those things uh, would potentially have, and the, and the reason for that distrust, and depending on which one of these reasons or any others are causing the distrust, will really impact, I think, how you formulate the case and the recommendations for what to do with the individual. Um, so the, the last general concept I want to talk about is a concept that's been around in, in the literature since the 1960s. Originally, it was termed healthy cultural paranoia, and I'm sure many of you have heard about this in graduate school and may have thought about it, hopefully, after graduate school as well. It was initially proposed, and, and again, I, I'm mostly talking about African Americans in, in these, in these uh, topics because most of the research has been done looking at African Americans. Um, but much of these, a lot of these concepts, I think, can be generalized to any individual who comes from a group that has been historically marginalized or discriminated against. Um, but this is the notion that initially, it was the notion that African Americans uh, often have developed paranoid-like behaviors due to historical and contemporary, uh, contemporary experiences with racism and oppression. Uh, now, the term paranoia, I, I think, has fallen out of favor for good reason. Um, because it really implies a break with reality. And this phenomenon is actually seen more, really more like an adaptive behavior, a mistrust of the environment, putting up a wall and some mistrust and not really assuming that the environment is going to treat you fairly, essentially un until proven otherwise. Um, and, and this has also been hypothesized as a reason for uh, misdiagnosis of African-Americans as having schizophrenia spectrum illnesses uh, over the years. Um, so the more recent term that you'll see in the literature is cultural mistrust. And sometimes even it's described, I, I like to describe it as a healthy cultural mistrust, really because it's an adaptive behavior. Uh, it's an adaptive mistrust for a lot of individuals. Um, and that can be, again, a consideration whenever you're working with anyone from any marginalized group. Um, I think I sort of have a duplicate with one of my previous slides here with some of these pieces. Um, uh, but one of the things that you might do to help address that um, sort of that inherent power differential in the examinee examiner relationship when you're doing a competency assessment is to address that power differential at some point in the process, maybe early on. Um, so you can say something, I think, like I fully recognize, particularly if you see someone who, who really seems nervous and distrustful of you when you get into that evaluation room, you know, you can say, I fully recognize that you, you may feel powerless in this process and really reassuring them, my job here is to help the court to understand whether you're ready to participate in your defense and whether you're able to. And then really just leave it with something broad like that and just say, do you have any questions for me? Uh, and let them ask the questions, let them guide the questions. Uh, and I think that this really can be a helpful part of the informed consent process. Um, I often see informed consents where the, the per, and I've even written this, you know, the, uh, the examinee was uh, informed of the, the uh, limitations to confidentiality and uh, the purpose of this evaluation and was able to repeat it back in his or her own words, uh, paraphrase the major limits. Um, now, I think those are important things to do, but also I think it's important for us to consider, um, you know, is the person's, uh, is, first of all, does the person trust that they're going to get a fair, relation, a fair assessment in this assessment relationship? Uh, and, there's a difference, obviously, between a forensic assessment relationship and a clinical relationship. 
It's not our goal or our desire to form a therapeutic alliance with the people that we're doing forensic assessments with. Uh, but I don't think that that, is, that uh, difference and understanding that difference is inconsistent with forming a relationship where they can trust that it will be fair, that they can trust that it will be accurate, and they can trust that it will be based on the reason why they're being evaluated and not some other reason, such as an unconscious or even conscious bias among the forensic evaluator. So I think allowing them to ask some questions about whether they're gonna get a fair shake uh, can help to really allow them to understand the process and feel that they can give you more accurate and honest information and can hopefully help to make sure that the right disposition comes out of the competency assessment. Um, and then when you're examining these different hypotheses that you may have related to possible role of cultural variables in any observed competency related deficits. So for example, if I have the hypothesis that, oh, this person's kind of sounding, you know, distrustful and maybe even a little paranoid about the system, um, is this a competency related deficit related to um, a mental illness and a, a schizophrenia spectrum symptom like paranoia, or is this a cultural mistrust that's a healthy mistrust? And maybe a little bit of discussion of the system and how it's supposed to work and hopefully how it does work will be helpful. Um, so when you're thinking about those different hypotheses, you really wanna be aware of some of those faulty cognitive processes that might impact our thinking. And in particular, I'm thinking about a confirmation bias. And that's really the tendency to pay more attention to information that confirms your initial hypotheses and to pay less attention to information that disconfirms your initial hypotheses. So you really don't wanna go into these uh, assessments thinking, you know, it's culture unless proven otherwise, or it's a, a symptom of psychosis unless proven otherwise. You really wanna go into the assessment open to multiple uh, ways of looking at the case and multiple hypotheses and really think about that throughout. That will hopefully uh, allow you to and, and create a, a venue in which you really think about um, all of the different possibilities and look at all the information and give weight to all the information in forming your opinions. Um, another thing that I think is just useful in terms of when you're considering these issues is you present your data in a data only section in your report and then your inferences and interpretations of the data go into more of an integrated interpretation section and that can really help to organize your report and to educate the reader on some of the issues like number one, what do the data say about this individual and that's more of the data uh, report section, that data only section. What do the data mean? That's starting to get into the interpretation section. And then what is the examiner bringing to the interpretation? Uh, and that's really the piece that your interpretation um, should reflect where that's coming from and why you think uh, something is the way it is. I think it's really helpful to uh, show in your reports that you considered and ruled out alternative hypotheses. I have often had in my report something to the effect of, I considered, but ultimately ruled out the possibility that uh, this defendant's uh, distrust of the legal system was really related to a, a healthy distrust based on previous experiences. Um, however, in this particular case, uh, it appears to be more related to paranoia related to the legal system because, and then list the rationale. And that rationale may be that there are other aspects of psychosis and delusional thinking that come into it. Um, that it really reflects a break with reality, uh, that it's above and beyond what you'd expect from a healthy cultural mistrust and so forth. Um, so I, I think uh, looking at those different hypotheses and then showing not only the final opinion that you have, but what were the other possibilities I considered and why did I rule them out in the end? Uh, so that's really all I have time to talk about today. Um, so I wanna thank you guys for your time and I'll open it up to questions. I will say that uh, in the slides, I have some extra slides at the end because when I first started making this, I wasn't sure um, sort of how long it would take me to go through various portions. And I have some additional sort of practical recommendations. In particular, I gave an outline of a study conducted by Grisso in 2010 that gives a lot of uh, advice for uh, essentially prescript prescriptions for how to improve your forensic report writing. Um, and that's largely based on an analysis of people who did not pass the writing samples in the forensic uh, board certification exa examination process. And they took the mistakes that those people had and turned them into, Grisso turned them into sort of prescriptive statements for what to do. So I have that in there as well as a few other slides.
Uh, but I'm not going to go through those today. It's, you're welcome to look at that after the fact, though. So uh, I'll open it up for questions now. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, in the question and answer section, a lot of people are giving really positive feedback. So I want to let you know that first. Um, the first question is, what I struggle with as a psychologist doing competency to stand trial evaluations is how much more I need to focus on beyond the statutory language defining competency. I appreciate the coverage of the relevant case law, but how much of that is within the parameter of the attorney handling the case versus the evaluating psychologist? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think it really is important to, to understand, um, and I didn't put this in the slides, but I think it's very important to understand that we are not the triers of fact. Uh, we are basically providing an opinion to the court and ultimately the trier of fact, which will either be a, a jury if it's a jury based process, or it will be a judge if it's a more of a judge based bench trial process will be really the ultimate decider of uh, the competency uh, decision. Um, but I think it is important nonetheless for us to understand the legal parameters. Um, because if you if you don't, and I've read many reports where it's clear that the person doesn't, they'll say this person clearly has schizophrenia and it clearly um, has delusional thinking, therefore they're incompetent. Well, they, they may be incompetent with that, but there really has to be a process of tying that symptom to the legal issue in question. Um, so there are two things I have. I have two um, models of competency in the slides after the conclusion here um, that you can look at. You can just Google them and you'll, you'll be able to find uh, a lot of writing on this. And so Grisso has a really nice model for looking at, at competencies in general, not just competence to stand trial, but all competencies, uh, where really he talks about, first of all, we need to look at what is the causal factor of any potential incompetence, um, and then tie that into, first of all, what are the deficits, and then what is the causal factor, and then tying them together and integrating them together. Um, so I think having a model like that is helpful. And then Bonnie has a model that's really helpful to me. I really like Bonnie's model of trial competence, which really takes that dusky standard and breaks it down into sort of everyday terms. Um, and there's sort of two major prongs to that approach. One of them is sort of uh, competence, essentially competence to uh, sort of consult with counsel and so forth and understand the process. But then the other one is what Bonnie calls decisional competence and really the ability of the defendant to take that information that they have about their case and to weigh the information and to, deter to make a decision based on that. Uh, and that, that comes out in the, um, if you look at one of the standardized measures of trial competency, the MCAPCA, there are three subtests, understanding, reasoning, and appreciation. And the reasoning subtest is, I think, heavily influenced by that model. So I think looking at those two models will really give you a framework uh, that can help you to sort of flesh out those legal issues and, and think of them in more clinical terms. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is being in these facilities during testing or even involved in the judicial context priming for stereotype threat and thus undercutting optimized scores? Um, I think it may be. I, I don't think we know the answer. Uh, I definitely think it may be. And that's really when I first started talking about stereotype threat with, with our trainees at, at Patton State Hospital. It was in the context of teaching an assessment seminar. Um, and so early in the year, I would, I would have them read Steele and Aronson's article because we do a lot of things like IQ testing, uh, ability-based testing in our facility, but not necessarily to answer a forensic question, uh, but to answer a question about the person's abilities. Um, and I do think that uh, just being in the system could potentially be enough to, to create that, that um, stigma priming and stereotype threat. Um, and so, so yes, I think that we should consider that. I think that should be one of your hypotheses. I don't think we have enough data to know how, um, how significant that is. Most of the research on particularly on ability level stereotypes uh, has been done in college settings. Uh, I think Steele and Aronson did it at, at Stanford University. So, I mean, we're talking about not only in a college setting, but a very uh, prestigious high achieving group of students. Um, so it, there may be some differences in terms of how that works in a different setting. Um, but I certainly wouldn't say that it's not there just because we haven't studied it yet. Um, so yes, I think it could be there is the short answer. I, I don't know the answer for sure though. Uh, 
The next question is, do you think the slang or language that members of marginalized communities employ may cause a shortcoming in their comprehension of a test? Also, what about how friendly the person is who's testing them? Does this affect results of the one being tested? Um, well, to answer the second question, I think yes. I think the degree of rapport you build with the, with the examinee affects what they're, how they're going to present, how they're going to do on the testing. I'll just give you an example. Um, there was a, a staff member at our facility at one point um, who, uh, in general, just I think the impression of a lot of us was that this person wasn't very engaged with the patient population. The person would make uh, pejorative type comments towards individuals with schizophrenia spectrum illnesses, um, you know, just didn't really seem to have a full appreciation for working in a setting like ours and for the, what goes on with those individuals. And that person, uh, more than anybody else, would get test results saying that the examinee was malingering. Um, and there really was no systematic process of who took which referrals. So it wasn't like we were just referring the malingering uh, examinees to that particular person. And I really think that what was happening is that there was a lack of investment of that particular staff member who is no longer at our facility, thankfully, um, a lack of engagement with them and a lack of respect for the, for the individuals that they were examining. So I think if you can project, first of all, feel it, hopefully, but then project a sense of respect for the individual that you're examining um, as much as you can. I don't think it's very easy to, un to fully understand what someone's going through in that situation unless you've been there. And most of us likely have not been in that setting as an examinee in a competency assessment. Uh, but I think that really helps that. Um, and then, so that, I think that answers the second part. The first part was about um, slang that may be used uh, differences in language across different cultural or ethnic or racial groups and how that may impact how they're perceived in terms of competency. I certainly think that um, we should not expect that somebody is going to communicate in the same exact way that, for example, when we're asking a question that we might answer that question. Um, so I think we have to be you know, cognizant of, of the communication style, of the language use, uh, and of what it communicates. Um, and so if you work with a particular group uh, that that communicates in a way differently from you. And, and the most uh, extreme example, of this would be working with individuals who are not uh, first language English speakers. So we have a lot of individuals in our hospital who, for whom English is a second language or English is not a language that they speak at all. And we're, we're either working through a translator or sorry, the dogs are going again here. Uh, they're either, we're either working through a translator or we're working with, um, uh, it, or we have a psychologist who's doing the evaluation who does speak that individual's language. Um, so I think just understanding and appreciating language differences is very important in terms of interpreting the test results. Um, you know, making sure that somebody feels comfortable speaking to you, they feel the way they feel comfortable, I think is important. And again, the more respect you show for them uh, in, the, in the introduction process, the more I think that they will show you what they really know and what's really going on for them. For those of you that need to hop off, it is a little past one o'clock. The survey has been posted in the chat, so please make sure you complete that before you leave. Also make sure you take a screenshot or save it because we do not email or mail hard copies to you. However, I'd like to invite you all to stay on because we do have more questions. Um, so the next question is, if there are no tests available with support for their validity with a certain population, how do you suggest conducting a competency or NGRI assessment? Um, that's a great question. Well, the first thing I'll, I'll say is that I, I don't think that um, there's any test for either competency or NGRI or, or really any forensic issue where the test should be dispositive of the issue. Um, I don't think that you can have a test of competency that like if you pass the test, you're competent. And if you fail the test, you're incompetent. Um, and I've seen some of these tests used that way. And there, there's definitely, there are different opinions in the field about the appropriateness of having any test for a legal issue. Um, so there's real nice, I think it's, uh, I, I hope I'm not misciting, but I think it's Randy Otto and, and some other authors have come up with a, a classification system for tests used in forensic contexts, where there are the sort of standard clinical assessment instruments that we use, they call them clinical assessment instruments, CAIs. And that would be things like a WACE or an MMPI or a PAI. They're assessing a clinical construct. And then there are tests that are specifically assessing a forensic construct, like the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool, the MCATCA, uh, or uh, Rogers Criminal Responsibility Assessment Scales, 
uh, the RCRAS, which assesses criminal responsibility. And they, they call those forensic assessment instruments. They're designed to assess a legal criteria. Uh, and then there are things that are sort of related to a legal issue, but not necessarily a forensic assessment instrument. They call those forensically related instruments. And those would be things like um, uh, malingering or feigning assessment instruments, um, like the SIRS or the TOM or something like that, um, that are assessing something highly relevant to the forensic question, but not assessing the forensic issue. So I think even the strongest proponents of forensic assessment instruments would probably argue that you cannot make your decision purely based on a test score. Um, so that's the first thing I will say. Um, but I think then you need to look at, if you are using one of those instruments, um, what was the normative sample and what were the findings for different cultural groups? And do I think that there's a meaningful difference between the person's cultural background, the person I'm evaluating, their cultural background, and the normative sample that this test was studied on? Is there a meaningful difference that could impact the test results? And if so, uh, then the test may not be appropriate and don't use the test. The nice thing is with forensic uh, issues is that I don't think you really need a test. Um, they can be useful to provide some one piece of information in a standardized format, um, but you're really making an ideographic or an individualized decision about this person's competency using a nomothetic instrument that was normed on a large group of people. Um, and there are, I've seen delusions slip through a test like the Macatka, where this person's got a very specific delusion about the legal process. And one of those tests doesn't really capture their catch the delusion uh, in a way that lowers the score sufficiently for them to look bad on the test. Um, so I think the thing I would say is look at whether the instruments seem appropriate if you're going to use them. Um, but even if you're using an instrument that you think is appropriate, I wouldn't base the whole uh, opinion on the instrument. It should be one out of many sources of data. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, can a healthy cultural mistrust, which drives withdrawal from counsel and impedes a defendant's ability to relate to and communicate with counsel, serve as a legitimate cause of incompetence? I think that's an excellent question. I, I mean, I haven't seen that addressed legally, but the one thing that I will say is if you read the Dusky Standard, um, they don't mention mental illness in there. Um, it's not really a, a major um, piece of the Dusky Standard. Um, and so this question has come up, for example, at our hospital, just with a, a separate but related issue. Uh, we had an individual at one point who, for whom we could not find a translator to translate that person's language. The person came from a rural area in Mexico and spoke a, a very rarely spoken Aztec dialect. And uh, we didn't have anybody who spoke that. This person spoke a very small amount of Spanish, basically just enough Spanish to tell us, I don't speak Spanish. Um, and so the question is, if we can't communicate with this individual, how can they get a fair trial? So it took a while, we eventually found a translator, uh, but essentially we held the individual as incompetent to stand trial until we could get a translator, which feels incredibly unfair to me because it was a, it was a fault of the system that we couldn't provide adequate translation. It wasn't, a, it wasn't anything inherent in the individual. It was the fact that we didn't have a system that could accommodate them. Um, so I do think that a, a healthy cultural mistrust that prevents someone from working with their attorney uh, may mean that they're not ready at the moment to stand trial. But I also think that uh, working with them, and, it, and it shouldn't take long to really discover that, to work with them, and hopefully to help them understand the process in a way that they at least understand that their attorney is intended to be there on their side. They may need to request other counsel um, in order to get counsel that they feel more trusting of. Um, and there, in most jurisdictions, I think there, there's a process for that. Um, whether or not they're granted that, that uh, new attorney is, is you know, to be said. Um, but I do think that if the person truly cannot participate in their process meaningfully because that mistrust is so high, uh, that I think that it may make sense to delay the trial for at least a short period of time to help them get competent, um, or to at least to help them to, to be able to fully participate. Uh, I don't think that that necessarily means that they're incompetent in the traditional sense of the word, um, but it, it means that they can't meaningfully participate. And you have to look at really what is the reason for a competency statute in general. And it's to allow people to meaningfully participate in their process and get a fair trial process. Uh, and the reason we have competency statutes 
is to allow for that to happen. So, uh, so I think that would be, you know, I'm sort of hedging on the answer because I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I do think that, um, that I would not feel comfortable sending somebody back to court if they truly felt they could not get a fair shake, if it was such a deeply ingrained mistrust that it really seemed to break with reality, uh, that they could not work at all with their attorney. Uh, but a lot of that I think can be, can be communicated in a report so that the court can really make that decision and hopefully find an attorney that they can feel more comfortable with. I'm curious why we're choosing to call the suspiciousness that many disenfranchised group members might have about getting a fair trial a healthy mistrust instead of an expectable and perhaps experience-based reactive mistrust. Why are we using the word healthy? Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think it, uh, you've made a good point with the question. So I would say that um, the term healthy has been used essentially to show maybe a better word than healthy is something like adaptive an adaptive mistrust. Um, I think um, the word healthy has been used essentially to show that um, that it's not pathology driven, that it is, um, it really is healthy, I think, for an individual who is in a, a um, threatening environment, any threatening environment, it is healthy for them to have some, some uh, barriers, some mistrust of that environment um, in the sense that it's, it's an adaptive thing. But I think you, you could choose, a, a, there are better words potentially. Adaptive, I think, would be a better word. Uh, the words that you had in your question, I think, could be good words. Um, I think that the term healthy has been used in some of the literature, largely to show that it's not pathology driven, that it's not paranoia. Because the initial term that was used in the late 1960s was healthy culture, or not even healthy, it was just a cultural paranoia, I think, was the initial term. Um, and really, um, you know, the, the term paranoia was in there. Um, and so, I think really it was a reaction against that. Um, but I think your, your point is well taken in the question that we could probably find a, a more accurate term. What are your thoughts on the impact of interpreters in forensic evaluations? Um, are there any biases between the interpreter towards the evaluee that could impact things or cultural issues that would not be identifiable to the evaluator? Yes, I certainly think that's possible. Um, especially if the evaluator doesn't speak the language, which in most cases when there's an interpreter, they don't. Um, so, so yes, I think that that's a possibility. Um, and I think that an interpreter adds an extra layer of um, sort of noise to the assessment. So if you think about sort of signal detection theory, there's the signal and that's sort of what is their true level of competency that they're trying to communicate to us. Uh, and then there's all this variance that's caused by noise by different things. For example, when I'm doing a competency assessment, sometimes, um, you know, the loudspeaker comes on the overhead PA system and they start announcing that, you know, grounds are closed because it's too hot outside or something like that. And that, that impacts the assessment. That's a piece of noise. You, uh, using a translator is definitely a piece of, uh, it adds noise. It adds variance that we don't fully know how it's impacting. So, so yes, um, I think really what you want to do is you want to think about, first of all, um, it, it's helpful to work with translators that you've worked with before that are well-trained, uh, that, that you feel comfortable with. Um, that's not always a possibility. Sometimes the first time you meet them is right when you sit down to do the evaluation. Uh, but if a, if a translator is well-trained and certified, hopefully they're directly translating. Um, so you're at least getting hopefully accurate communication. But the, in terms of the the, examinee trusting the process and trusting in the examiner, I think you're an extra step removed from them when you're using a translator. And it's really hard for them to fully trust that you're even getting an accurate communication. So I think it does impact things. I think it's, it's something you have to consider in your, in your forming your different hypotheses and your counter hypotheses and determining which one you go with in the end. Um, but I don't think we can fully get rid of that. I think that the best thing to do when possible is to have an evaluator that speaks the language, uh, but that we obviously know that's not always possible. Um, but yes, it, it certainly impacts things, I think. What are the implications of that system is against me feeling being rational or reasonable and not paranoia? Um, that's a good question. I think the implications are that, uh, first of all, that the 
I'm going to use the word treatment, but it's not necessarily something you're treating, right? It's not a pathology, but the, the way you intervene, I think intervention is a better word. The intervention will be different for somebody who has a rationally based mistrust of the system. Um, that person, first of all, I don't think needs to be pumped up with antipsychotics. If that's, if that's really the only symptom of potential psychosis is a mistrust of the system, uh, I think that that obviously, we don't want to have somebody getting administered medications that are inappropriate. So that's on, on the more extreme level. Um, but there could be somebody who does have a psychiatric, a bona fide psychiatric condition, but also has that mistrust above and beyond any psychiatric symptoms. Um, so I think the implication is that the way you intervene is different. The way you intervene would be more geared towards psychoeducation about the process, um, maybe educating the court on the fact that the uh, defendant needs to, may need more time with the attorney. The attorney may need to spend a little bit of extra time explaining the process, that the attorney needs to understand that there are these, uh, these beliefs and the, that a lot of them are rationally based. I can't count the number of times I've been told the system has screwed me before, it's gonna screw me again. And that's coming even from people who are not part of a, a historically marginalized group as much, at least in terms of racial or ethnic background, but they are part of a marginalized group in the sense that they've been in the system for years. And that's a, that's a form of marginalization too. Um, so, so I think that the way we intervene is different. And so the recommendations you would put in your report would probably be different. Uh, if they're in a hospital setting, like where I work, definitely the recommendations you give to a treatment team would be very different for how to work with this individual uh, than if it's based on a, a like a psychosis. Um, so hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. Um, Dr. Glassmeyer, I know you have somewhere to be pretty soon. We're about 15 minutes after. So um, I want to say thank you very much for today. I think you hit record attendance for us. So that's kind of cool. Um, thank you all for joining us. Please make sure you um, click on the chat button. You can download the survey there. We'll stay on for a few more minutes to allow everybody to do that. But again, Dr. Glassmeyer, thank you. We're really grateful for your talk today. Okay, thank you. Thank you to everybody for attending. Have a good day. Thanks, you too.